thankful that um, even if we don't feel worthy, we can come to your presence when we have Jesus in our lives and we find grace, we find mercy. We um, can call ourselves children, children of God. So thank you. Thank you for this time of worship. Thank you for your presence and we pray this in your name. Amen.
right, church, here we go. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you all. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, and great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. bones will sing great are you Lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. In gray, are you, Lord? It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise, it's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only.
Let's clap to him today. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.
Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. And all praise will rise to Christ our King. Spirit, I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. By your Spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me the resurrected king is resurrecting me the resurrected king is resurrecting me as josh keeps playing we're gonna let him play kind of a little bit quiet through all this but i want us to pray and I want you to think about what needs resurrected in you. We know that when we come to the cross, when we come to Jesus, he gives us life. He gives us a new position in Christ. But there's still things that are undone, still things that need to get dealt with, still things that um, have, maybe, have maybe over time hurt us, things that need to get addressed. And let's pray today that no matter what we go through in life, that we um, understand that it's Jesus that can bring health and wholeness back to us. And so whatever you're holding on to today, let's just offer it to the Lord. This is our worship. This is a way to honor him. This is a way to trust him with everything. Let's pray. Father, you, you've allowed us to sing a song that has some pretty good theology in it. It's a song that reminds us that Jesus not only walked this earth, not only taught about you, not only touched people, did miracles, but he went to the cross and he died on that cross um, to prove his love for us. But he rose again and he rose again to show us that um, in him there's power there's the ability to overcome. There's the ability to have health. There's the ability to forgive. There's the ability to, um, to just trust you with everything. So, Father, that's what we do today. This is our worship. Whatever we're holding on to, we give it to you today. And we pray that it won't be just something that happens on Sunday, but something that we live by the rest of this week. So thank you for these moments in worship. We offer ourselves to you and we, we give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. We um, want you to be pleased with our posture today. So thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for loving us. And so we give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody say amen. Amen. All right. We're going to have you sit down for just a few minutes before... Kids are dismissed for Kids Club. We have something we have to do, and we always like the kids to be a part of this. So um, I'm going to ask Stan to come up, Janice to come up, and Michaela to come up on stage. And Michaela, you can bring, Stan, you can bring your family, anybody, I don't care. We want to see you with your family. So feel free to bring your families up here if I called your name. 
We, we as a church, we have the privilege today to, to welcome three new members of the church, and that's always fun. Uh, if you haven't already figured out, sometimes the members that are joining the church have already been a part of the church. They already f- feel like they're a part of the church. And uh, we, the formality of membership has never been a big deal to us. But today, we're going to um, give out a certificate and make this official. And um, the certificate just says this. This certifies that on this day, this person is now a member of Grace Community Fellowship, and it's signed by my name, our district superintendent, and the president of our denomination. So the first one is going to go to Dr. Stan Udd. Let's clap for him. Thank you, brother. I could uh, go on and on about each of these people up here, how they add value to the body of Christ. And if you haven't already figured this out, when you become a part of a church, you add value to it. You have a chance to use your gifts, your passion. And, of course, Dr. Ud, we learn so much from him, and so we just appreciate you, brother. Second certificate will go to Michaela. i got to make sure I give her the right one. And uh, Michaela, we love you. We love your family. We, um, you may not know, you might not all know this, but uh, I met Michaela and Noah. I got to know them. Noah was, of course, a part of the church. Michaela, we, we all went on a missions trip together, actually with the Methodists, the United Methodist Church. And uh, I would have never imagined that years later, you guys would be married, um, kids, and uh, just serving, serving Jesus. And so you guys are awesome. We love you. And so let's clap for Michaela. <laughs> this goes to Janice. You see her up here. Um, she serves in the youth ministry, the middle school youth group, middle school refuge. And Janice, thank you for just not giving up. Um, I remember Janice serving in our kids' ministry back when it was in the gun shop over here. We were just moved into this building. We had our youth ministries over there. Anybody that want to find out about that history, ask Teresa about the pudding fiasco and Ted. Ted was a part of that. Um, it was a blast. We had pudding on the ceiling. It was amazing. But now our, our youth ministries, our children's ministries are here. Janice chose to move up into a different age group, and now she's in the middle school youth group, and we appreciate you and your family. So let's clap for Janice. So I'm going to pray for them, and then when I say amen, we're all going to get up, and you can say hi to one another, and then the kids will be dismissed for Kids Club Upstairs. Lord, it's always fun to have a a stage full of people because that's the church. The church is made of people, families, families that are deeply in love with you, and they care about you, and just thank you that they're making this formal decision today. They've chosen to make this their church home. Thank you that they're a part of our family. Um, we want to be a Christ-centered, grace-filled church family. And so thank you for each of these people up here today and the families they represent and the way they connect with us. And we just pray a blessing upon them wherever they serve, whatever they do next, a blessing upon not only them but their families. Um, we know that you have a plan for them. And so just thank you today we get to welcome them like this. And so we just want to applaud you again, and thank you, Lord Jesus, that we get to celebrate like this. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, clap one more time, and then stand up, greet one another. Kids are dismissed for Kids Club.
extra. All right, we find our way back to our seats. Or not. Lights won't work, Dean. You need like a garden hose. Never know. Try something new. I don't know how. The waves are settling. I'm just enjoying watching uh, Bob's animation as he's explaining a story. I try not to use my soldier voice a whole lot. I don't make a lot of friends that way. Hi, Tim. <laughs> Welcome. Um, let's, let's start off in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this church, for the body of believers. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for this ability to, to speak from it. Lord, I, I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill this room, that the words I speak would be touched by you so that the words I say would be true to your, your will and your intent and that the, the message would be heard on not only just our ears but in our hearts and that we could take something from this and grow spiritually, whether it is to be awakened to salvation or whether it's to grow in our faith. I just pray that you would use me as a vessel that my message wouldn't be what's heard today but it would be your message that was felt. And we just, we just pray this and we thank you so much, Jesus, for what you've done on the cross for us. And I pray this in, in your precious name. Amen. Amen. So we're continuing on in, in our uh, study of John. We're in chapter 18 now. And uh, some of the chapters we've gone through, like last week, are very, I don't know, I guess you would say um, intense in one area. There, it was one chapter just on a prayer. And so there was... There was a lot of information just in that chapter, in chapter 17, about the prayer. And then other chapters, like the one we're talking about today, there's a lot of movement. There are, there are many things that happen within that chapter. And so it, it, it's a different way of, of looking at the scripture because we have to be able to, to move from position to position and see what happened for multiple people in multiple locations and, and not just be able to focus on one thing that was said, like the prayer of Jesus last week. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, read through the entire chapter 18. It's 40 verses. And then we're going to talk about some of the things that we see inside of that chapter. And to put this message into context, remember that, that Jesus had uh, um, just had this prayer for his disciples. And so we read in chapter 18, the, the initial reading will be through the NLT, the New Living translation but most of the teaching i do will be from the esv the english standard version and it says after saying these things which was Jesus' prayer jesus crossed the kydron valley with his disciples and entered a grove of olive trees judas the betrayer knew this place because jesus had often gone there with his disciples the leading priests and pharisees had given judas a contingent of roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him now with blazing torches lanterns and weapons they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him, so he stepped forward to them to meet them. Who are you looking for, he asked. Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Judas, who, had betray, who would betray him, was standing there with them. As Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Once more, he asked them, who are you looking for? And again they replied, Jesus the Nazarene, I told you that I am he, said Jesus. And since I am the one you want, let these others go. He did this to fulfill his own statement. I did not let a single one of you, one, did not lose a single one that you had given to me. And that was from his prayer the previous chapter. Then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. But Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their commanding officer, and the temple guards arrested Jesus and tied him up. First they took him to Annas, since he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the, priest at the, high, the high priest at the time. Caiaphas was the one who had told the other Jewish leaders, It is better that one man should die for the people. 
Simon Peter followed Jesus, as did another of his disciples. That other disciple was acquainted with the high priest, so he was allowed to enter the high priest's courtyard with Jesus. Peter had to stay outside the gate. Then the disciple who knew the high priest spoke to the woman watching the gate, so she let Peter in. The woman asked Peter, You're not one of the men's disciples, are you? No, he said, I am not. Because it was cold, the household servants and the guards had made a charcoal fire. They stood around it, warming themselves, and Peter stood with them, warming himself. Inside, the high priest began asking Jesus and about his followers and what he had been teaching them. Jesus replied, Everyone knows what I teach. I have preached regularly in the synagogues and the temple where the people gather. I have not spoken in secret. Why are you asking me this question? Ask those who heard me. They know what I said. And then one of the temple guards standing nearby slapped Jesus across the face. Is that the way to answer the high priest, he demanded? Jesus replied, if I said anything wrong, you must prove it. But if I'm speaking in truth, why are you beating me? And then Annas bound Jesus and sent him to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was standing by the fire warming himself. They asked him again, you're not one of the disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I know I am not. But one of the household slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you out there in the olive grove with Jesus? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the rooster crowed. Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ended in early hours of the morning. Then he was taken to the headquarters of the Roman governor. His accusers didn't go inside because it would defile them, and they wouldn't be allowed to celebrate the Passover. So Pilate, the governor, went out to meet them and asked, What is your charge against this man? We wouldn't have handed you over to him if it wasn't a criminal, if he weren't a criminal, they said. Then take him away and judge him by your own law, Pilate told them. Only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. And this was to fill Jesus' prediction about the way he would die. Then Pilate went back to his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought into him. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked. Jesus replied, is this your own question or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate retorted? Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, So you are a king. Jesus responded, You say that I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify the truth. And, who lo- and all who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. What is truth? Pilate asked. Then he went out again to the people and told them, He's not guilty of any crime, but you have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each Passover. Would you like me to release this king of the Jews? But they shouted back, No, not this man. We went Barabbas. And Barabbas was a revolutionary. Some texts would say he was a robber or a terrorist. And so we just unpacked a lot in those 40 40 verses. Like I said, it wasn't one location. It wasn't one person speaking. A lot of things have happened. And oftentimes we do kind of an expository preaching where we we focus in on what was said and how it was said and everything that's going around at that time. We're going to kind of take more of a a thematic approach to to this chapter because there are so many things going on. What I want to look at is, as I've named named my, my sermon today, how far... I want to look at how far some of the the people inside of this story were willing to go. And so we're going to start off with with three people. That would be Pilate and Annas and and Caiaphas. And these people are the unbelievers. These are the ones that they were willing to do whatever it took to discredit Jesus. They hated Jesus. Jesus. Another, another term we could use for, for these three would be the world. Because they were about themselves, and they were willing to use whatever lies, whatever techniques they could to discredit, like I said, Jesus himself. Let's look at some of the verses we just read. In verses 19 through 24, it says, Annas question, or it says that Annas questions Jesus, but he can't find any fault in what he's saying. Instead of letting him go or realizing the truth, he binds him up and sends him to Caiaphas, the the next high priest. 
in chapter er, in verse 14 it says Caiaphas was the one who told the other Jewish leaders it's better that one man should die for the people he had already determined what his response would be he'd already decided where he wanted this to go and in verse 38 this is the words of of Pilate the governor what is truth Pilate asked and he went out and told the people he's not guilty of a crime Pilate was faced with truth and his response was well what is truth but like I said this is this isn't just these three people or even the crowd that condemned him and asked for the terrorists to be re- to be released this is the same today this is the world John chapter 15 verses 18 through 20 says this if the world hates you know that it hated me before it hated you if you were of the world the world would have would the world would love you as its own but because you are not of this world but I chose you out of the world therefore the world hates you remember the word that I said to you a servant is not greater than his master if they persecuted me they will also persecute you if they kept my word they would keep yours also now this isn't a political statement I'm making this isn't trying to take God's word and and make a like I say a political statement or, or try to sway you one way or the other in in your in your thinking but I want you to think about today what's going on in our world today and it may be a little easier to understand that in the midst of what we've had over the last year or two with elections with politicians with COVID, with the, with the messages we get from, from media or from leaders. And think about what was considered truth and what was exposed as real truth. At some point, whatever side of the, the table you, you sat on, there was a discrepancy in what you heard at one time to what you heard the second time. Because as, as Pilate said, well, what is truth? Truth is what they make or what they are willing to push out or what they're willing to allow to be spoken. And it's amazing that Pilate's words so many years ago, almost 2,000 years ago, are exactly what we face today from the world. Today they, they tell you that if you're a Christian, then you're automatically hateful and bigoted they tell you that you can't pray at a school or publicly or sometimes even in your own church that you have to sit so far apart and wear a mask and you're not allowed to sing you're not allowed to to shake hands you're not allowed to worship but you are allowed to open a bar or you're allowed to have a peaceful gathering for political purposes but only if your truth aligns with their truth because that's what the world's plan is is that that what they say is right is right truth is an obscure meaning Ephesians 4 18 says they darkened in their they are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart now when I'm speaking of the world i'm not only talking about presidents and governors and senators and world leaders but i'm talking about leaders inside of schools i'm talking about leaders inside of businesses i'm talking about people on the street we're talking about singers people in in the in film and tv people that are social media influencers people that are woke uh, if if you didn't understand the term woke, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> woke is, is the one that says, my truth is the new truth, and anyone else is a false truth. Even though Jesus, from the beginning, was the truth. But we have this, this culture now where we're able to say, well, I don't believe that Mike wears black shirts. I, th- I think it's white, and if you tell me anything is different, then I will shun you because that's that's the way culture is trying to take it because it is the world and it is trying to base itself 
on anything but truth. But I tell you that that's not the most dangerous of the people inside of this story today. And when I say story, I kind of have a hardening my heart, a difficulty in my heart when I say the word story because this isn't a fable. What I mean when I say story is it's an account. This is something physically that happened. When I read the word of God and I say story, do not confuse it for fable or fairy tale. Understand it is an account. The most dangerous of the people in this story was Judas. Because Judas was a wolf in sheep's clothing. See, when, when Judas was on the earth, he was a disciple. He proclaimed to be a follower of Jesus. He was allowed to be the treasurer. And it said that he was numbered among the disciples and was allotted his share in the ministry. He was part of the team. And yet he betrayed the living God. His real self came out. Judas finally showed who he was, not when he was amongst the believers, but once he was surrounded by others that would discredit. He waited for that perfect opportunity to show who he really was. And after spending time with the Messiah, after Judas saw miracles, saw people healed, saw people raised from the dead, Judas sold Jesus out for, well, that's a lot of money right there. Wow. A couple silver coins. Does anyone know how much those 30 pieces of silver are worth? I tell you, I know that, that it seems really lucrative to us right now, but I did a research, and based on 2021, our, our value of currency, depending upon which size those coins were, it was between $100 and $500 that Jesus was sold out for, that someone lied to to discredit Jesus to put money in his pocket. 500 bucks. Now, it says that after he saw Jesus was condemned, and this comes out of Matthew 27, 3 through 5, Judas changed his mind, and he went back to the priests and he, the elders, and he tried to give them back the money, and they said, not my problem. So Judas threw those pieces of silver down and went and hung himself over $500. Because he was more interested in the gaining of wealth than in the truth. And he was willing to be part of the body until he saw an opportunity to exploit it. And like the first group, this person exists today too. I don't know who it would be. Statistically, there's a chance that one of us has that heart. I love every one of you in here as a brother and sister. Everyone that I've ever talked to, I fully believe you're not that person, but I don't know. And that's the most dangerous person. Hebrews 13, 2, 13 12 says this, Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you that are evil, unbelieving in the heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. See, that's, that's the problem we have today in the church, is that there are people who profess that they are ministers of the gospel, who say that they are part of the body of Christ, but you'll notice that they don't preach Jesus. You'll notice that it's about giving alms to their congregation so that you can have a better life. It's a prosperity gospel. It is telling you that if you just give more to us, then you'll be blessed a hundredfold. And all the while, while well, the congregants are listening to this person that they believe is in charge, all they're doing is filling that person's pockets so they can buy bigger houses, faster cars, and sometimes jet planes. Because they are, as Judas, they are using their position to fill their pockets regardless of the outcome of Jesus or the church. In Matthew 24, 24 through 25 says this. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. 
See, I have told you beforehand. And 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15 says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. And like I said in the first group of people, we're not just talking about their leaders. We're not just talking about someone who is an, a lead pastor or is in charge of a ministry or has the title of deacon or elder. It could be anyone inside of the church. If you're part of the body, but your heart's not part of the body, then you're against the rest of us. Revelation 21.8 says this, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So you need to ask yourself, if I'm sitting here today, am I just smiling and shaking hands and singing the song so I can walk out the door and discredit everything that I know to be true inside of these, these walls? How do I present myself when I'm not here for an hour and a half on Sunday? If I was to see you on the street, would I know you were a Christian? Or would I know that you are a discredit to Christianity? Are you worried about how you will gain wealth or notoriety? Or are you focused on God's word and his truth and Jesus? But I want you to know that if you find yourself in either one of those two first categories, whether you find yourself to, to be a non-believer or if you, you find yourself to, to not be invested into what you, what you claim to be, then there, there's still hope. There is still hope. Because all you have to do is confess. All you have to do is accept Christ. All you have to do is repent. All you have to do is give it to Jesus. And he will change your heart. Romans 10, 9 through 10 says this, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But it doesn't stop there. It's not just being saved. Ezekiel 36, 26 tells us, And he will give you a new heart, it says I, and a new spirit I will put within you. And, you be, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. If you repent and give your sins to God, whether you're a non-believer or whether you're a non-believer pretending to be a believer. We call them cultural Christians, right? I'm a Christian because my parents were Christian, because I have a little cross around my neck, because I belong to a small town of Christians. I see it. That's all right. I got one on too. It's not, but it's not what we have on here. It's what we have in here, right? And if, if, we're, not, if we're not in here, then all we have to do is pray that, that God will, will soften our hearts and forgive us and bring us into the fold. Make us one of his sheep. Because Jesus died for us. And that, that has to be part of every sermon. That has to be bottom line known. If you've never heard this before, if you've heard it every day for the last hundred years, I don't care. I'm here to tell you that while we were still sinners... Jesus died for us. If we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, we will receive a new heart. The Holy Spirit will come into us and we will be made anew. We will be God's children. We will be brothers and sisters in Christ, but only if we accept Jesus first. So we've talked about the non-believers and we've talked about the wolf in sheep's clothing. A third category that we see here in, in the story is Peter. And Peter kind of represents the majority of us Christians because Peter truly loved Jesus. Peter was one of the disciples also, and he was strong in his faith, and he would fight for Jesus, but Peter had limits. And I think most of us have limits. For Peter... The same guy that had the sword and lopped off an ear 
while he was with his group of disciples. That same Peter, when he was by himself, when he was faced with a majority that were opposed to him, and when he was asked, are you one of the disciples? His response was, I am not. What's amazing is his response wasn't, nope, wasn't, not me. It was to take God's name for himself, the I am. And not only did he say he's not God, which is, which is absolutely true, but he used it as a negative to say, not even close, not part of that group. God says, I am, and Peter says, I am not. He quickly realized the weight of his decision if he would have said yes. And at that point, he reached his limit. He knew how far he could go. That was the line in the sand. And today, we, like I said, all of us have a limit. Very few of us will be known for being a martyr. Right? Whether we're talking about guys like like um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer that that was hanged by the Nazis, or whether we talk about um, people, the, the, or, the original apostles that were all murdered for their faith, or if we're talking about people in countries right now that can be executed or imprisoned for their faith, places where we send missionaries that, as Brad said, when, when, when they prayed for them on the, on the conference, that they had to wear masks so you wouldn't be able to identify a face and find out what country they were going to. Because in those places, you can be killed for your faith. And Peter faced that. Luckily, we live in the United States, so we don't, we don't have that. Not, not yet. Um, if we're not careful and we listen to the world, we may get to that point. But we still all have a limit. We still all have an area where how far can we go? No further than this. Sometimes, um, sometimes it's, it's a little more obvious. Sometimes it's a little more minuscule. For example, uh, I have a friend named Matt, and I've spoke about it, Matt before, and he accepted Jesus a few years back. And Matt's, one of Matt's best friends just buried his four-year-old son from cancer. And so Matt called me from Kentucky or sent me a text and his I am not statement happened then when he said, I don't know if I can follow a God that just let a four-year-old child die. And we're working through that. I'm praying for Matt. I, I, I hope you pray for him too. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes, sometimes it's a struggle to, when you hit that I am not, when you hit that limit. Sometimes it's really, really small. Just this morning, Adam and I were talking, and uh, Adam had, had reached out to everyone that had been in this church at one point, but was no longer in attendance when he, when he came on, on board. And he, we were just talking about how sometimes it was the littlest indiscrepancy that caused the I am not statement. Someone felt slighted. Someone felt that maybe Mike used the wrong version to preach out of maybe that pastor brad and pastor adam have different views on predestination or end times minuscule but people still use that to say you know what my faith isn't worth it whether they go to another church or whether they just stop attending altogether because it's more important that they hold on to this grudge than they are part of the fold. Everyone has that. Like I say, very few of us will ever be able to see our faith all the way to the point of death. But that's not, that's not how we're called to live. I want you to, to understand that, that for Peter, there was something that we have that he didn't have at that point. Something even Peter didn't have. And his name is the Holy Spirit. Jesus hadn't completely hadn't been resurrected, hadn't brought the Holy Spirit into the world. Peter was kind of on his own. We don't have to live that way. We have the Holy Spirit living in us if we, if we have Jesus as our Messiah. 
Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So we know that there are people that are openly opposed to, to Jesus. We know that there are people that are here, but their hearts and motives aren't here. And we know that there's many of us that are like Peter. And when I say many of us, remember, I'm, I'm starting this conversation with myself. I'm not pointing out to anyone. I'm pointing to myself on these. But I can tell you that there is one last person we want to speak about because Jesus is the standard for our faith. Not only is he the direction of our faith, not only is he what we have faith in, but Jesus shows us what proper faith is. When, when Peter said, I am not, Jesus was approached by the soldiers and his words were, I am he. Jesus said, yeah, I'm the guy you're looking for and I am. He quoted the name of God. And when he said, when Jesus said, I am he, the, the, the verses say that the soldiers backed up and fell on the ground. It's kind of an image of what was to happen. God's word tells us, therefore God has highly exalted and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. This comes from Philippians 2, 9 through 10. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. Whether they choose to bow or whether they will be pushed to their faces, the name of Jesus will conquer all. Those soldiers didn't plan on being in the mud. But when they heard the name of Christ, they were. Jesus also said, I'm the one you're looking for, so let everyone else go. Because Jesus put everyone before him. Even though Jesus is God, he put himself behind everyone. He humbled himself, made himself meek just like the rest of us, and was willing to die on a cross. Here are some of the other attributes that Jesus had that I want you to just to notice. In verses 19 and 21, it says that he was honest and open when persecuted. When, when asked by Annas, what have you been teaching? He said, I have nothing to hide. Ask everyone who has heard me. I've been in the synagogues. I've been in the temple. Ask anyone. They'll tell you exactly what I've said. He wasn't trying to hide his statements. He wasn't trying to keep them from anyone. He wanted the world to know. In verse 36, it says that Jesus was focused on heaven. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom's in heaven. He wasn't focused on the world, which is lies. He focused on heaven. And in, verses, in verse 37, Jesus tells us that his mission was the truth. He said, I was sent here to, to give the truth, and everyone who knows me knows it's true. So each of us can fall somewhere along this spectrum of where we sit in our faith. Each of us has to look into our own hearts and say, do I believe? And how far am I willing to go with what I believe? Maybe we won't be killed for our faith. But we do need to be able to show it. We do need to, be, to know how strong we are. We need to know how far we're willing to go. And I tell you that in a few short weeks, a few very short weeks, our church is going to go on a mission surge. We're going way out, all the way to, well, to Woodbine and Missouri Valley. <laughs> it's not a stretch, right? It seems easy. It seems really easy because we're not, we're not going to Taiwan. We're not going to some far off country. We're not doing anything that seems difficult but 
each of us has to ask ourselves, where does my faith sit? Am I willing to go paint a house, give up a Saturday, and show love to someone who I don't even know? Am I willing to pray for that person? Am I willing to fast for a couple of hours? Am I willing to go a couple of days without eating and, and be in prayer instead? Or am I not that strong in my faith? Is that something that's not important to me? Are you willing, am I willing, to learn about prayer walking? Am I willing to walk through this, the, the streets of the town, whether it's here or there, maybe with a t-shirt on that says Jesus' name on it? Am I willing to share my faith? Am I willing to pray and be with others? I got to tell you that it frightens me at times because I'm more of an introvert. You know, I, I do a lot of things, but I don't like to go out and mingle in crowds. But for this, for Jesus, for our faith, yeah, I can go that far. And when the next thing arises, when someone needs prayed for I'll go that far. And when there's someone hurting and in need and needs assistance, then yeah, I'll go that far. I don't know how far I can go. But I know that each time I'm faced with something, I'm going to ask for, for God. I'm going to pray that He would strengthen me, that His Holy Spirit in me would allow me to go that far. Because I have something I want to share with people, and that's the good news. I want people to know about Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, as I said at the start of this sermon, we just thank you and love you so much. We ask that you would continue to soften our hearts to remove any sinful desires or distractions from us as we continue to worship your name. I pray that you would forgive us of our sins. I know that as believers, our sins are already wiped clean. But I know that also it's important to you that we confess them, that we are honest to ourselves of where we fall short. I pray you will strengthen us. I pray you will show us how far we can go. I pray that, that you will use us as, as tools to forward your ministry, to forward your church, and to bring people the good news of your son Jesus who died on a cross while we were still sinners so we could be forgiven, so that we could escape the, the hell that we deserve and be part of your family in heaven. And while here in this earth, I pray that you would continue to, to grow us. We call it sanctification. I pray that you would continue to mature us, that we would understand our position and understand your power and presence, and become more like you every day. So Lord, we give you this day, not just this sermon, not just this service, but we give you the day and the week and our lives, and we pray that you will allow us to come back next week and still worship your name. And I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.